Hello and welcome to Tales of the Wild. My name's Mark, I'm the host of the only podcast where you can learn scientific facts about animal species through stories. In this episode we'll follow the life of a special species of frog. Frogs in general are fascinating creatures, the metamorphosis they go through having started life in a totally different form, much like a caterpillar, the way they breathe and drink through their skin, the huge diversity in examples of camouflage and also aposematism, which is the use of bright colours or other methods to appear conspicuous and communicate danger to predators. The species we'll look at in this episode has a couple of unusual adaptations which makes it a very interesting species to learn about. It's an animal that's as deadly as it is intriguing. I'm going to start this episode off with a short Japanese poem or haiku from Japan's most famous poet, Matsuo Basho. Furu ikiya kawazu, tupikomu mizu no oto. Roughly translated into English by Alan Watts, this haiku reads as The Old Pond. A frog jumps in. Plop. Welcome to Tales of the Wild. No chance to escape my wrath, weakling, he thought. He swallowed the fly down with a crunch as its papery wings and rigid hooked legs were squeezed out of shape by the closing walls of his mouth. Like most frogs, he needed to close his eyelids when swallowing a big meal. This pushes the oversized eyeballs inwards against the roof of the mouth. This, together with the tongue raising upwards, forces the meal down the frog's throat. It's a strange concept for us to consider using eyeballs as mechanical tools like this, but it's pretty common in the amphibia class. Unfortunately, one of the hooked legs got caught in his throat on its way down, and the frog gave out a weak croak as he started to choke. After a brief moment of panic, he managed to dislodge the leg and swallow it. Nice try, puny fly, he thought, proud of his accomplishment. After finishing his meal, he stared out into the local rainforest environment. He stared in a way reserved only for reptiles and amphibians, like a proud statue of an unblinking, unmoving but striking pair of bulbous eyes that reflected the bright white of a few gaps in the canopy above. The eyes were two large plates of a shimmering pale gold fragmented by hundreds of tiny black hairline fractures. In stark contrast to the pale gold surroundings, each eye opened into a glossy light capturing black vertical slit in its centre. Those eyes were built for detecting prey in a dark environment. You've probably noticed that not all animals have round pupils like we do. Some have vertical slits, such as crocodiles, vipers, cats, foxes, and our frog here. Others have horizontal slits, such as some other frog species, sheep, deer, and they're also found in the rather demonic looking eyes of goats. These two slit designs, along with the standard round pupils, are nature's favourites, but there are some other anomalies, such as the crescent-shaped pupils of sharks or the bizarre curving W-shaped pupils of cuttlefish. There are also eyes with more than one pupil, such as those of a certain fish species that lives between worlds. But that's a mystery for another day. So why would there be a difference in the type of pupil that an animal has? Surely our frog here would benefit from round pupils, which seems like a good shape to absorb the most light for their size. The fact that this is not the case suggests that there must be something else at play here. When we think about animals that have vertical slit pupils or round pupils, probably the first animals that come to our minds are those that we're most familiar with, cats and dogs. Cats have a vertical slit pupil and dogs have a round pupil. One obvious difference between these two is that cats are active both in the day and in the night, whereas dogs are very strictly active during the day. We know that it's easier to reduce light intensity when you have slit pupils, 
because they're controlled by lateral muscles which squeeze the pupil's edges together rather than constricting a ring of muscle around the pupil which becomes structurally self-limiting. A cat, for example, can use its slit pupils to reduce light intensity on the retina 135-fold compared to a 10-fold reduction in our own round pupils. So that might explain it, but it's certainly not the full story. There are nocturnal species with round pupils, such as tarsiers, and there are diurnal species with slit pupils, such as sheep and goats. And these slit pupils don't reduce in size no matter what the light intensity is. A team of scientists who published their findings in the Journal of Life Sciences in 2015 looked into the foraging patterns of 214 species. They found that species with pupils that are vertical slits are more likely to be ambush predators that are active in the day and in the night. In contrast, those with horizontally elongated pupils are very likely to be herbivorous prey species with eyes at the sides of their heads. Circular pupils were linked to active foragers, or animals that chase down their prey. So why the difference? Vertical pupils are better at focusing on vertical edges of objects in your field of view. This is very useful for depth perception necessary to estimate distances to prey. It becomes even more effective when combined with stereopsis, which is the way in which the field of view from each individual eye overlaps so that the brain can use triangulation to estimate the distance to an object. This is of course why we have two eyes, and if you've ever seen a bird of prey nodding its head up and down, they're fine-tuning their long-distance stereopsis by adding information from different viewing angles. Horizontal pupils are usually found on eyes which are located at the sides of the head of an animal. This offers a better method for detecting approaching predators across a wide field of view. To avoid predation, they need to see panoramically, with minimal blind spots. They have to see well enough out of the corner of their eye to process both the predator location and the ground to quickly jump over or avoid obstacles during their escape. Interestingly, this horizontal direction of the pupil is so important for detecting predators that when grazers like deer or sheep rotate their heads to eat the grass, the eyeballs stay fixed in position, maintaining that horizontal direction. Sheep have been found to be able to rotate their eyeballs 10 times more than we can. So finally, round pupils tend to be more suited to animals that chase their prey, and interestingly there seems to be a size component in it too. So larger species like leopards and lions, known as the big cats, tend to have round pupils, whether they're nocturnal or not. And smaller species such as domestic cats and ocelots have vertical slit pupils. The team found that the improved depth of perception found with vertical slit pupils was better for estimating distances for short animals rather than taller ones. But these are very general rules and there's plenty of exceptions. So it's quite likely that other factors play a role. Perhaps having a common ancestor with a round pupil makes it more difficult to evolve a slit pupil in just a few hundred thousand years. Or perhaps they're omnivores and they're both a predator and prey species themselves and have to reach some sort of compromise. Anyway, the frog we're looking at today has vertical slit pupils in his eyes. He's a typical nocturnal ambush predator. These pupils helped him to locate the fly buzzing around in the low light conditions and direct his attack. His attack is rather pathetic looking because it's preceded by a low energy lunge. This species is not the jumping kind, but more of a lethargic climber. It's a large species of tree frog, and it would require too much muscle to launch its mass into the air. It does however compensate with a more substantial whipping of its tongue at the end of the lunge. In most mammals, the tongue is attached to the throat, but in frogs it's attached to the front of the lower jaw and then fold it back on itself. They use this front attachment as a pivoting point, and when the muscles contract, this causes the tongue to whip out. The contraction of the muscles shortens the rather long tongue by as much as 60% of its resting length during the strike, and this is why the frog needs to accompany the tongue whip attack with a lunge. If the tongue makes contact with the prey, 
it must stick, otherwise all that energy is wasted. To achieve this, frogs have a particularly viscous saliva. In fact, the saliva is 175 times more viscous than that of human beings, so it can stick to slippery, furry or feathery surfaces. Food was not the problem for our frog. He was, by his own admission, a very accomplished hunter of all manners of prey, including anything he could fit inside his mouth, from a baby cockroach up to an adult mouse. His prey mostly came to him as he waited patiently with his bright green skin blending in with the colour of the foliage perfectly. Much like a chameleon, his slow, stealthy, deliberate movements were very difficult for other animals to detect. He'd never gone long without a meal, particularly with the vast abundance of meal-sized animals he found here in the rainforest of Bolivia. His problem was a hunger of a different kind. He was an adult male, and he was overdue to find a partner to mate with. He knew that he was the biggest and strongest male with the best singing voice, and that the lack of interest he'd generated at the pond over the past few evenings had just been a combination of bad luck and probably inferior females who were not capable of appreciating his vast depth. Despite zero successes so far, he had a good feeling that tonight was going to be the night. It was entirely likely, in fact highly probable, that the females he would actually be interested in had heard him singing and spent the day travelling to this location from all around the forest. The pond he frequented was a small romantic clearing in the dense rainforest. The soft ripples created by nocturnal insects laying eggs on the surface caused the moonlight to dance. Fireflies often came by to put on their performance, adding to the ethereal ambience of the setting. The luciferin compound in their abdomens is triggered intermittently with the timed release of the enzyme luciferase to create synchronized bursts of a soft green. It seemed like in this place time itself paused to take a rest. It was very popular with the local frog species which would congregate in order to lay their eggs in the water or above in the overhanging leaves. As he approached the pond, he walked a little taller and he puffed up his throat sack just a little bit. He wanted to make a good impression. Yes, his luck was going to be different tonight, he thought, with a sharp inhale and a slow release. He had an uncomfortable feeling in his stomach. That must be the fly I just ate, he thought. There's no way I can be nervous about this. No other frog matches my physique or my pristine voice or my intriguing complexity. I must be so impressive that I'm making the female shy. Perhaps I should tone it down a little bit this time. As the moon rose in the dark blue sky, it started to get quite loud at the pond. For any other species, this location would have been very uncomfortable. The air was very humid and still, the dark green leaves were dripping wet even though there was no rain. The sky was full of strangely shaped moths and unusual nocturnal insects. For frogs, this was paradise. Not only were the cicadas, nocturnal birds and crickets calling, but also the frogs themselves had started. Frogs can make a strikingly diverse range of sounds between different species using almost identical techniques. Just as a few examples, there's the red toad, the bubbling kasana, the banded rubber frog, the desert rain frog and the Emmy music frog but our frog's call was more impressive than all of those the waxy monkey frog at least that's what he thought you'll notice I included a toad as one of those examples 
That's because all toads are frogs, belonging to the frog order of the amphibian class, which is Anura. Very generally speaking, there's a family known as Buffonidae, and these are a type of frog that we call true toads. This includes species like the famously invasive cane toad, or the recently extinct golden toad. True toads tend to have bumpy skin and prefer to crawl rather than to jump, and they lay their eggs in long strings rather than aggregated clumps, but these are generalizations and there are plenty of exceptions. Frogs and toads have vocal cords like many mammals, and in addition they have inflatable air sacs on or near their throats, which act as amplifiers. This is an important tool to make sure that every female in the area hears you. Some females were more picky than others, and amplification might improve your chances. When drawing attention to oneself, you increase your risks of predation. Researchers have found that frog-biting mosquitoes and midges are attracted to traps which play audio recordings of the calls of certain frog species. Additionally, in 2014, a team of scientists found that bats were able to use the calls of a frog species called a tangara to locate their prey. The frogs produce a simple call and a complex call with chucks at the end which are highly attractive to the females, but also to these predatory bats. The bats use echolocation on the physical structure of the ripples on the surface of the water created by the frog's vibrating air sac as he calls. The female frogs were attracted by the chucking sound in the call, which was also the easiest part of the call for the bats to localize. In other words, females preferred the males who would put their lives the most in danger with the most conspicuous call. Interestingly, the females were less picky when they detected a predator in the area presumably because they would risk their own lives by travelling to the male. They would, however, always still pursue a calling mate, even if there was a predator present. This is probably because they only live for 10 days, so it's much better to mate with a boring, low-risk, inferior male than to risk not mating at all. Our frog had reached his favourite performance platform. This was a thin branch overhanging the pond. He thought this spot had the best acoustics and that the females could get a good look at him. He readied himself for his performance. He took in a deep breath and began to grace the animals around with his call. He thought it was going very well, seemingly unaware of how melancholic his song was. It was far too depressing to excite any of the females here. Or was it? He spotted a lone female who just appeared next to him in the pond below. Unfortunately, she had a mate on her back already. No matter, she wasn't his type anyway. Much too skinny. He could hear another male calling nearby. He wasn't threatened by the sound, not at all, but it was getting rather irritating. This was his spot. He crawled over to the male, who did not budge, but continued singing. In a fit of rage, he gripped this male by the head and tried to pull him off the branch. The male didn't move, except for his back leg, which raised up slowly towards his side, like the string of a crossbow, and then promptly unloaded into our frog's abdomen. This was sufficient to knock our frog off his branch. 
But what the foolish male didn't know is that he actually preferred this spot down on the ground, and even better than that, he'd just spotted a female nearby. Our frog slowly crawled towards her and began to sing his song. She turned to get away from him to escape the unbearable melancholy, and as she did, she revealed on her back a smug-looking male who winked at our frog. Male frogs will hold on to females in a state called amplexus for several hours at a time. They hold on using specialized pads and claws on their front feet called nuptial callosities, which also help to stimulate the female to lay her eggs. Frogs make love froggy style, which is not quite as exciting as it sounds. The male waits until the female releases the eggs from her body and fertilizes them using his cloaca as they leave. The eggs in this species are laid in a nest made of three leaves which overhang a pond so that the tadpoles, once they hatch, can drop directly into the water. During this piggyback state called amplexus, the female's not against other males attempting to dislodge her partner. She wants to ensure that only the strongest male is capable of fertilizing her eggs. In this particular case, while she didn't fancy his chances, she was not prepared to risk it and she tried to make a quick exit. Our frog was not deterred by the blatant rejection, mistaking it for playing hard to get. He was actually encouraged and crawled as quickly as he could up to the male to try and pull him off her back. He gripped the limbs of this male frog and tried to leave her skin from skin, but he had no luck. Then in classic frog fashion, he attempted to wedge his triangular head between the male and the female to try and force them apart, but that wasn't working either. The male attached to her back began to yawn and then closed his eyes as our frog was pulling at his leg. After tugging at the male's leg for a few more minutes, our frog decided that he would let this male have the female. She wasn't in his class anyway. He climbed up off the ground and began calling again. That old familiar feeling of doubt tightened around his stomach, but he wouldn't allow it to surface. He stayed focused on the task and began to sing again. Several hours passed. He'd been singing most of the night, but he hadn't had any luck. Perhaps these females were just too dumb to interpret the subtle complexities of his song. To make matters worse, it had just started to rain, which drowned out the sound of his voice even more. One good thing about the rain was that all of his singing had made him very thirsty, and now he was able to quench his thirst a bit. To drink, he simply let the rainwater fall over his body, and the water seeped through the pores of his permeable skin. It was a very efficient way to take care of hydration, but also makes frogs prone to taking up pollutants very rapidly. Remember the old adage, do keep pond clean or froggy gets sick, which we mentioned in the previous episode as a mnemonic for the biological classifications of life. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The rain slowly subsided, and an orange light began to penetrate the thick canopy around the frog pond. Most frog species retreated to the dense foliage below where they could hide from the drying action of the sun. Unlike reptiles, which are covered with scales, the skin of most frog species is moist and permeable, meaning that they can dry out very easily. However, his species had a special trick to deal with this problem. He rubbed his arms and legs against the skin of his back, which covered them in a waxy substance, which he then proceeded to cover his body with. This natural sunscreen is a special adaptation for this species of frog, and it gives rise to their name, the waxy monkey frog. It allows them to tolerate much drier conditions than any other tree frog. This method of retaining water is so effective that their rate of evaporative water loss is only about 5-10% that of other frogs, and comparable to that of lizards. As he settled down to get some sleep after a long disappointing evening, 
he was haunted by this creeping feeling of self-doubt. Perhaps the problem didn't lie with the females. He didn't understand females very well. Like most frogs, he'd never met his mother. As he drifted off into a sad slumber, he began to dream. He dreamt about a beautiful princess frog. She was everything he looked for in a partner. She was highly symmetrical and excessively large, even for their species. In the dream, this princess frog had been adopted by a wicked toad stepmother. The toad, jealous of her stepdaughter's beauty, happened to dabble in witchcraft and put a curse on her. Froggy, warty, warty frog, I banish you from this here bog. I curse you with a brand new shape. Now leave this place as a walking ape. As the princess began to transform, the toad mother seemed to take pity on her and added, But should you meet a worthy king, you'll transform back when you hear him sing. The dream continued for our frog, and after easily dispatching the guards, he stormed into the toad's lair, where he found himself face to face with the toad stepmother. She tried to stop him, but was awestruck by his magnificence. As she begged for mercy, he consumed her in one gulp, although her leg did get stuck in his throat and cause some mild panic, even in the dream. The princess was so impressed, she knelt down and kissed him, and as he sang an incredible song, she transformed into a huge female frog. His song had worked wonders, and she welcomed him onto her waiting back. He was overwhelmed with excitement, and... And then he awoke from the dream. He knew what he must do. He had to find his princess. He'd seen upright walking apes in the forest before. The ape village where they slept was not too far from here. He left the frog pond immediately with a hop in his stride. He used his special natural sunscreen to be able to travel during the day as well. And over a period of several days of crawling, lunging and eating, he finally arrived at the local village. The upright walking apes here were sitting around a fireplace laughing and shouting. He watched as a few more of them came out of the rainforest with speared monkeys, snakes or birds and roast the animals over the fire. One guy had a hat made of the brightly coloured feathers of exotic birds and he was constantly smoking a very long tobacco pipe. The frog watched from a distance, looking out, hopefully, for his princess. After three days of observing, finally, a small canoe arrived, with two tribesmen and two tourists. It was a male and a female, and he looked at the female ape. She had dirty matted hair tied back with a bright piece of cloth. She had long wooden hoops in her ears and was wearing a very colourful top, which hung loosely around her fragile frame. Poor thing, he thought. This was her. That was definitely the cursed princess from his dream. Over recent years, spiritual tourism has increased substantially in the South American rainforest. There are several organizations offering authentic shamanic traditional healing ceremony experiences. These ceremonies have been used traditionally by the natives for all manners of purposes from simple healing to inducing visions of the future. The ritual of Cambo, or Sapo, is a type of voluntary envenomation. During this purification ritual, a shaman healer from various South American countries deliberately burns the right shoulder with a glowing stick from the fireplace. Excretions from the skin of a waxy monkey tree frog are then applied to the fresh wounds. It has a number of effects, few of which are pleasant. A feeling of subtle euphoria can soon be followed by nausea, vomiting and diarrhea, but this is probably to be expected in a ritual that promotes purification. In addition to this, it supposedly brings luck to hunters, increases stamina and enhances physical and sexual strength although there's currently no scientific evidence to support any of these claims. The substance does have an exceptionally high content of active peptides easily absorbed by burnt skin, 
These peptides act on opioid receptors in the brain, which result in many of the reported psychoactive effects. The opioid peptides specifically from frogs are not found in any mammal species. The peptides are known as demorphins. In addition to shamanic ceremonies, demorphin has also been used illegally in horse racing events, because horses that are less sensitive to muscle pain will run faster. Jason and his girlfriend Amanda were an open-minded couple who had been planning their adventure to Bolivia for months. After a lot of online research in various forums, they decided to contact a shaman guide who was one of a rapidly increasing number of authentic indigenous tribe shamans who offered this specific ritual known as the Cambo ritual for a small fee. When they arrived, they got out of the canoe nervously and were approached by a very short shaman. He had a big smile on his face and ushered them over to his hut, where he gave them a brief introduction to the ritual and showed them where they would spend the night. They unloaded their packs and slept until the late afternoon, exhausted from travelling in the heat. The waxy monkey frog looked on as his princess went into the hut with a male upright walking ape. That fool thinks my princess is another ape, he thought to himself. He started to crawl closer when he was promptly plucked out of the tree by a large hand. As the two tourists emerged from the hut, better rested, they were greeted by a glowing fire. It was smoky enough to keep most of the insects at bay, and it lit up a circle in the rainforest clearing. The rainforest was getting noisier as the evening progressed, and this was adding to the anticipation that they felt. Amanda could hear frogs in the distance, and asked if these were the waxy monkey frogs she'd heard about. The shaman shook his head, and pointed to his tribal colleague, who was holding two of the most unusual looking frogs she'd ever seen. They had huge pale gold eyes with black vertical pupils. The shaman gestured for Jason to go first, and said that the big frog was for him. The smaller one was for her. Amanda didn't take kindly to this, and insisted on having the big frog herself. The shaman laughed and agreed. He then took Jason by the arm and held the burning end of a thin stick against his skin where it sizzled. Jason's eyes filled up with water and he clamped his mouth shut so as not to scream. Then the shaman carefully rubbed a feather on the glistening back of the smaller of the two frogs. When he touched the feather tip against the burn wound on Jason's arm, Jason shouted out and slumped down on the floor. Then came the second dose, which caused almost immediate vomiting. When Jason recovered from this, he was given a third and final dose. At this point Jason was lying on his back, sweating profusely. He told the shaman not to give Amanda as much. Amanda was not encouraged by watching what had happened to Jason, but they'd paid a lot for this experience and she wasn't going to back out now. She gave the shaman her arm, and he inflicted the first burn wound. Our waxy monkey frog looked on excitedly. He didn't like being tied up and having his skin rubbed with feathers by these apes. It was so stressful it made him sweat poison, but he was distracted from the ordeal when he saw his princess. He began to sing to her, as mentioned in the witch toad's curse. Like Jason, Amanda's eyes welled up with pain caused by the burning wood. Then the shaman wiped the feather on the larger of the two frogs and tickled the tip into the burn wound. Within moments, Amanda could hear her own heart throbbing in her head. She started sweating and her breathing increased dramatically. While it didn't look good from the outside, she was experiencing some mild euphoria and mild distortions of reality. The frogs she'd been listening to earlier seemed to be getting louder and more intense. She felt very weak. She hunched over and began to throw up. It's working, the frog thought. She's transforming. He looked on as she rocked back and forth on her knees. She shook her head and tried to concentrate as she was being administered the second dose of the poison. At this point she'd had enough. 
She slumped down to the floor and lay there, as the shaman and a couple of other members of the tribe found the two of them with leaves. Our waxy monkey frog was untied and then slung into a bag where he was carried back into the rainforest. The ape hand came into the bag and pulled him out again and put him on a branch next to the other frog. This other frog happened to be a large female and when he got his bearings he suddenly realised that the female frog that he'd been released with was the princess who had now been liberated from the curse and made the full transformation back into a frog. Finally, a worthy partner, he thought, as he approached her. He began to sing, and this time instead of his usual melancholic tune, it was something a little bit more uplifting. It was not that much more successful, but at least she didn't run away this time. In the absence of any competition away from the frog pond, he was the only male for her. She allowed him to climb on her back, and they crawled away in the light of the moon, searching for a new pond. And that ends this episode of Tales of the Wild. I chose to talk about this species of frog because of their very unusual appearance, their adaptation to survive in drier conditions, and because of their interest to indigenous people and tourists seeking novel experiences by voluntary poisoning. If you enjoyed the story and learning about this species of frog, please support the podcast by subscribing, leaving a review, or sharing it with others. If you would like to support the podcast with donations, thank you, and please find out how to do this in the podcast description or via the website, talespodcast.com. See you next time on Tales of the Wild.